every day in the valley, someone will call the police reporting seeing a UFO. Strange lights in the sky moving in strange ways. But it is very rare for thousands of people to call and report seeing the same lights in the same spot at the same time. It happened last night, and eyewitnesses who saw it say it's like nothing they've ever seen before. This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Hey guys, welcome to a very special episode of Somewhere in the Skies. Well, today's guest is of no surprise. You did see his image in the featured image, and he's right here with me today. We're going to be talking all about the Phoenix Lights incident from 1997. Now, Jason and I have a uh, a connection to this event uh, for a television show that you're going to see popping up in the next week or so when this airs. Uh, however, Jason has an even closer connection to the phoenix lights he was there when it happened and he saw it so guys welcome to this live stream today and jason welcome back to somewhere in the skies buddy oh ryan it is so fantastic to see your face my friend i, I miss you and i am so excited to be here today thanks my man we were catching up off air for any of you who are new to the show um it is of no I guess, mystery that Jason and I are not only colleagues in the UFO world, we are the greatest of friends. So we caught up on a lot of stuff that's going to be going on in the future over at Rogue Planet and uh, the future of Somewhere in the Skies and everything in between. Uh, but Jason, this will be the final episode that will be taking place here for me in New York City before I head off to uh, my new destination so um, I couldn't think of a better guest to have on Somewhere in the Skies for that, my man. And I'm going to remember this forever with it being your last New York City studio interview. For now, for now. For now. Who knows for what now. the future holds? New York. That's right. That's the exciting thing about to, the future. Yeah, yeah. Always finds a way to pull you back, too. Um, well, let's say hello to some of the people in the chat here. We got Luis from the Unidentified Celebrity Review. Andrew, Austin, Matthew Riots here. Matthew, thank you so much for the stu super sticker. Buddy, appreciate that, guys. The super chat is open. If you want to ask Jason some questions about the Phoenix Lights or I or anything you want to talk about UFO related, super chat, super stickers are open. Great way to help the show. Grant, we have here all the way from Australia. Awesome. Econ nice. Car. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, welcome, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, first time here. How much I miss Chosen Fallen. You just tuned in at the beginning, my man. So thank you for being here. And excuse me for calling you my man. I have absolutely no idea who you are behind that name. So apologies already. What a way to start the show, Jason. What a way to start the show. Um, hey, it can't but, hurt to apologize. Over-apologize. That's always a good good philosophy. It's safe. It's safe, especially in today's world. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be talking all about the Phoenix Lights. Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners and viewers are very familiar with this case. But uh, for any of our our listeners and viewers who are new to the UFO world, we know that our community has probably quadrupled in the past few years. And people are just getting into this topic and learning about the history of it. You know, we got the Roswells and uh, the uh, Socorros and the Rendlesham's and stuff like that. But uh, Phoenix Lights is up there, uh, really high up there in terms of legitimacy, credibility, theories on what it could have been. Um, but yeah, before we get to your personal connection, my man, could you tell us a little about this event? Maybe kind of the broad sweeping overview of what the Phoenix Lights was, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I would love to. As you already said, I mean, for anybody who's dipped their toe into to the UFO field or UFO research has most likely come across the Phoenix Lights. Uh, but this is essentially the most famous mass UFO sighting when you look into UFOs. This occurred in March of 1997 in Phoenix, Arizona, as the name applied, implies, but uh, it was certainly affected more people and was seen in more places than just Phoenix, Arizona. It uh, prompted reports all the way up uh, 
top of the state, even into Nevada, coming down through the state and even into Mexico. So what, what happened on March 13th, this was at night, this was between, uh, you know, witness reports vary, but between 7.30 and 10.30 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. And thousands of people across the state of Arizona reported seeing various things, which is not uncommon with UFO sightings. Everybody interprets things different ways. Everybody has different vantage points and things like that. But it's uh, most commonly accepted that uh, perhaps multiple events occurred that night, multiple different objects in the sky. People saw different things. The first one being what some describe as a mile wide craft, some solid craft consisting of a series of lights. And the number of those lights varies depending on who you talk to, but five, six, seven, eight, nine, all sorts of different uh, configurations of lights, but mostly in sort of a V formation, traversing the entire state. Uh, a second event, like people call it, uh, occurred in the West Valley of Phoenix, and it was a series of lights, sort of in a boomerang pattern, that just sort of hung in the air for an extended period of time, for hours even, some report. But as I said, there were multiple things reported that night. Everybody's description doesn't line up, which again is common with UFOs. A lot of different stories, but ultimately the story here is there were unknown lights that were seen by thousands of people in Phoenix. These all were reported, it was investigated, tried to be investigated by government officials, and ultimately we still don't know what the Phoenix lights were. Right. And we'll get to that investigation, quote unquote, in a little bit. Um, we've got some really cool archival footage to show you guys of the lights of um, news footage that came out around the time that the event happened. Um, so we're swinging back into the 90s today. This is going to be fun to to see some of the uh, the coverage of this back then. Um, but let's go ahead, Jason. First, I'm going to show one of the videos uh, of the Phoenix Lights that was caught by one of these witnesses. And that's by a gentleman named Tom King, who I actually got to meet when I was out in Phoenix investigating this case, which is another tease of something we're gonna talk about a little bit later too. Um, and yeah, Tom was one of those individuals who was able to catch these things on camera. So let me pull that up and we're gonna take a quick look at his video. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Why not? Yeah, they keep coming. Wait, look at them! I got that Wait. one on video. There's a four of them. Look at there's three of them all together. I got the third one popping. Over to your left. There's one behind the chimney. Okay. One just squared up. I got four of them. Major sighting here. That's no. There's five. Oh! Another one just showed up. They're multiplying. Whoa! Maybe somebody's setting up lights. You see that? No, those are in the sky. The too. There's one underneath the house too. There's one behind the chimney. Okay, come we need to go here. to take control. I can't see how this works. How does this work? Holy! Really? Oh, you got a shit! Have okay, you seen that before? No. That's weird. They're lined up in in a pattern, man. There's geometry behind this. Yeah. All right. So again, you can obviously hear the excitement in their voices, um, which I always love, like, especially when we have these new UFO videos with like even the people in the Navy being like, what is going on here? Yeah. Um, I would assume, you know, that was Tom in the background talking and it was clear that it was unnerving for everyone there. I mean, no matter what it was, everyone was freaking out. And like you mentioned, Jason, they started calling local law enforcement. Or, um, you know, the airport. A lot of people believe that these were coming from either the airport, Sky Harbor, or um, the military bases nearby, uh, which, again, very contentious. We'll get to kind of that, the military aspect of all this, too. Um, but, yeah, yeah, what did you think of um, Tom's video there? That's definitely one of the most famous ones, I believe. Yeah, for sure. That's one that we see a lot of news reports and stories talking about the Phoenix Lights. And like you said, it captures the, the excitement of, of observing something that hasn't been seen before. These people clearly had not seen that, that kind of display in the sky before. So it's very exciting and very confusing too. And that confusion and excitement is what prompted so many people to contact the media, the airports, Luke Air Force Base, Davis Mothman Air Force Base, uh, all these different sources trying to get answers. And you know, when you see a video like that, just, just without context, you know, I, as a, as a UFO researcher and investigator, would look at that and think, yes, this looks very much like military flares because you mm -hmm. see a straight line of light. You see them popping on and off. And that's usually a good indicator of military flares. And that's certainly one of the prominent explanations that was eventually offered by the military to explain this. You're right. Right. And, uh, well, let's sort of start with that. 
the um you know people started reporting this to new fork i believe immediately as it was happening um and and the airports and correct me if i'm wrong but around this time you know when the the calls first started coming in they weren't taking responsibility right the military and whatnot weren't they saying like yeah we got nothing up there am i correct in that Correct. Yeah, the the military. Um, well, <laughs> as far as their their willingness to to provide any answers, uh, they kind of stonewalled for quite a while. It wasn't wasn't till months later, even half a year later, that they offered an explanation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And again, this is where this is going to get messy and muddy, guys. So bear with us as we kind of stumble through the Phoenix Lights, because there's kind of two incidents, and um, that's a really interesting aspect of this whole thing is are we dealing with some sort of cover-up or whatnot? But um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Jason, let's talk about your personal involvement with this sure. case. You were living in Phoenix at the time, and uh, you were a part of this. And again, you now have the bragging rights to say you were part of one of the most famous UFO cases of all time. So yeah, give it to us, man. Um, what did you see? How, set, it, set this up for us, if you don't mind. Tell us the story of your sighting. Sure. So this is the, the quick overview. So I was 17 at the time. I was uh, living in Phoenix's far west valley on the other side of the Australia Mountains. Um, and if you've read about this case, you're familiar with the, the uh, Australia Mountains. And it's uh, with the flare theory, it's uh, commonly brought up that the flares disappeared behind the mountains. It sort of winked out. And that's that's because they were descending like military flares do. Um, I was on the other side of the Australia Mountains, and what I observed, and again, I, I can't speak for what other people saw, I can only speak to what I saw, mm -hmm. and what I saw did not descend at all, um, and I was quite familiar with military flares, I'll talk about that in a minute, but what I saw was sometime during the night, I, I have no idea when this was because it was so long ago, so I'm not going to pretend to, I'm go going to guess it was around 9 o'clock at night. I saw a series of lights, um, and I can't remember exactly how many lights, but somewhere between seven and nine lights in either an, a sweeping arc or a, a triangle formation, formation in the sky almost directly over my head. Just I could go out in, into our yard, stand, look up, and see the series of lights just suspended in the air. No movement, no sound, no apparent change at all um, in brightness, intensity, uh, there was no flickering, nothing like that. These lights were just stationary lights hanging in the sky. It was crazy. And they had a slight similarity in, resemble, or in appearance to military flares. And I know that because I grew up, again, way out in the middle of nowhere. And to the southwest of me is the Barry Goldwater Test Range, where the military frequently drops these flares in their training exercises. What these flares do is they illuminate the ground for, for the A-10s flying. Uh, it illuminates the ground, ground targets so they can do night training. Okay. And these high intensity flares, when they drop, um, I've seen them so many times. So it, it's hard for me to describe what they look like because I can pretty much tell just by looking at something that it, it is a military flare. But these high intensity flares that were used really only have a burn time of about five minutes. They're suspended by these parachutes. They do kind of drift and, and, and burn while the magnesium or, or whatever they're composed of is burning. And uh, they kind of drift down. You'll see a smoke trail. You'll see, you know, like with Chinese lanterns, you see a pulsing of the light because there is a, a, a fuel cell, a, a, you know, something burning there that uh, creates this burning effect, a strobing effect. Um, but what I saw was in the sky for well more than five minutes. Oh, and it wow. wasn't that I went away and maybe they dropped more flares in the same spot, so I was confused. I watched these things for a good solid 30 minutes to know that they were there for a long period of time. They weren't flares. They weren't, at least no flares that we know of. I mean, these were completely stationary. They didn't uh, wink out. They didn't uh, descend at all. They were in the sky for such a long period of time. And again, these were special high intensity flares that were being used but they only have a burn time of approximately five minutes. So for me, the flare idea went out the window pretty quickly. It's not something that I seriously considered at the time. And since then, you know, I did serve as a professional full-time UFO investigator and journalist. And during my time being a professional UFO investigator, I 
you know, probably examined hundreds of UFO photos and videos every single year uh, during my seven year span. And, you know, I got pretty good at being able to identify flares and things like that. And, you know, to this day, I, I haven't been able to satisfactorily, satisfactorily come up in my mind with an explanation for what I saw because it doesn't align with flares. It doesn't align with other things. And the, the flare theory is also problematic for me because, well, we can get into the, the government's explanation later and, and we can go deeper into that. But that's essentially what I saw, just a series of lights suspended in the sky, no sound, no motion, no, uh, no apparent change at all. Just, and they were there probably for 45 minutes. I did leave at one point, but when I came back, they were gone uh, 45 minutes later. And then I remember seeing them on the news that night. So. Wow. So uh, a couple questions, follow-up questions for you. Um, was there anyone else there when you saw this? And did it ever um, you know, cross your mind to try to record this thing again these are the two questions every ufo witness gets were of you course. alone when this happened and why didn't you get that now today we live the luxury of having you know a camera with us 24 7 yeah. and a lot of people do ask that question that if we have this technology right now why aren't more people catching these things on film but again this is back in 97 um so yeah uh other people there and did it ever cross your mind to try to record this so my family was certainly home. Um, I believe they were just inside watching TV. And I, I seem to recall, you know, mentioning it to them because they kept seeing me run outside and look at them. But, you know, to them it was just, oh, there are lights in the sky. That's cool. And, you know, I don't think they ever paid any attention to it or thought that it was something anomalous that they should come and, and experience as well. Um, so, no, I mean, for me, it also wasn't like this urgency thing or, or something that I was like, oh, my God, we're being attacked by aliens. It, to me, was just more of, of intrigue. You know, it was something that I'd never seen before. I thought it was extremely fascinating. And my mind couldn't come up with a logical explanation for what I was seeing. And to your second question, you bet I tried to record it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're right, it was 97. And my family was probably the only family I, I knew of at the time, um, you know, and our friends that had a video camera. And this was a, a uh, yeah, good old video cameras. Um, but yeah, I did actually take the video camera out and try to record these lights. So I, I did, and I don't remember how long I filmed them or how good the footage was. But yeah, as I always say, that, that footage is lost and I've, I've never been able to, to discover it, not because Men in Black stole it, but because my parents probably recorded over the footage by you know, recording one of my brother's soccer games or something. So <laughs> you know, I, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent pouring through boring family home videos, you know, looking through the tapes, hoping that there's like a piece of footage there you know, somewhere that uh, I haven't seen yet, but uh, yeah, I did. I, I definitely got it on camera. I just have never been able to find that footage. Wow, good for you, man. Well, yeah, well, hey, maybe it's still well, very- Well, good for me. It tor tortures me to this day it. that I don't have it. Uh, I know, but at least you tried. Did, no, um, that was pretty, so you were pretty young when that happened. Um, did you have an interest in UFOs prior to seeing this, or was this kind of your, your first initiation into this topic? It was certainly my first, kind of notable UFO sighting. Um, I'd spent a lot of time in the desert. Well, I lived in the desert, in the middle of the desert, middle of nowhere. So the only thing for me to do on weekends with my friends was go camping. So we spent a lot of time camping out looking at the stars. And, you know, I would see interesting things as you do if you just stare at the sky. Uh, but my interest was always there in, in space, in astrobiology, in just the, the universe in general, and the mysteries that come with that. So, you know, always a, a big believer in, in extraterrestrial life, thought that the universe is teeming with life. And, you know, I always had that, that, uh, that interest. And certainly I grew up on sci-fi, a big, big Star Trek, Star Wars fan. Um, those were the shows that I would watch. Uh, so I had the interest, but the sighting itself was the first major UFO sighting that I'd personally been involved with. And it, at the time, it didn't really affect me that much, again, beside just the, the intrigue that I had. Um, you know, I, I, I'd say UFO sightings I've had since then have had more of a, you know, wow factor on me. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it didn't start my UFO career, but it certainly kind of got me a little more excited about it. Awesome. Awesome.
I love I love hearing the origin stories. You know, uh, every UFO researcher seems to have one, which is awesome. Right. I do want to point out a few things. We got some questions for you, Jason. Um, guys, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, you can either do the super chat, which will highlight them for me, and you also help the show. Or I'm starring a lot of these, which we'll try to get to at the end of the show as well. Um, but some of them do have to do with your sighting, Jason. Cool. But I do also want to add um, the gentleman's ha handle that I couldn't pronounce earlier. Um, I'm in, I'm the hospice RN you and Jennifer interviewed by the freeway. I was on I-60 in Tempe when the craft flew over my head. Welcome. Welcome to Somewhere in the Skies, my man. Um, I know exactly who this is. I'm not going to give his name because uh, you will see him on television very, very, very soon um, talking about his experience with the Phoenix Lights. And it's one of the closest encounters with these lights that I've ever heard. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Luis asks, 1997 couldn't be, wouldn't be too early for drone swarm tech. What are Jason's thoughts on that possibility? Could we be dealing with drones with these things? Again, I can only speak to my personal sighting, but I'd say zero possibility with that, again, because of the zero noise. Uh, you know, certainly in 97, <laughs> I, I think any drones would have, would have uh, you know, made considerable noise, um, but also wouldn't have remained stationary in the same spot for such an extended period of time. It's always possible, but I think that's very unlikely. Okay, okay, gotcha. Um, well, let's move on with the timeline of the event. Now, once all these calls started coming in and um, the news started covering it, there was no, you know, putting the lid back on this thing. It was out there. Hundreds and hundreds of people, like you mentioned, saw it. And uh, people were looking to the government to start to, you know, deal with this. Uh, local government. We're talking the governor of, of Phoenix at the time, Fife Simonton. And... Um, what ended up happening, and we're going to show the video. I know you've seen it a million times, Jason, but for a lot of people who aren't aware, the governor did talk about what had happened and wanted to touch on that, yes, we're investigating it, and we think we found the culprit to the Phoenix Lights. So let's go ahead and play the infamous video of Fife Symington and the press conference. Good, why not? Yeah, Thank you. That's not it. There we go. Leave it a serious offense for anyone, human space alien or otherwise, to engage in mysterious activity in our nighttime skies. That is why I will personally ask that the perpetrator be prosecuted to the fullest for the havoc wrought on our entire community. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. Don't get him too close to me, please. It's, you know. <clears throat> Now, this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> uh, there it is, Jason. There it is. The infamous press conference. So yeah. um, did you happen to see this back in the day when it actually aired live? I do remember seeing it. Yeah. And, and we, we do have a, a special guest joining us today. Oh, my. Is that the actual mask? What, 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 that, explain that it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's the same <laughs> one that, that was worn, not the actual one, but yeah. yes, the okay. same, the same costume that, uh, Fife Symington's chief of staff wore. Yeah. And that, <laughs> that is courtesy of our good friend and, and fellow rogue planeteer Maureen Ellsbury. She got that uh, many years ago and, uh, she gifted it to me when she, she moved back to, to Seattle. But, uh, yeah, that's the actual one. And it sat in a storage locker. So Arizona heat and everything, it's, you know, being this rubber mask, it's, it's very much uh, dried out and very crumbly. So I wouldn't attempt to put it on right now. But. Yeah, I don't blame you. We won't make you do that unless we get like a $200 super chat. Hint, hint, guys. Help there out you go. The <laughs> so, yeah, with, with, with Simonton and at, at that time, the Phoenix Lights wasn't that big of a deal. It was locally, there was a lot of buzz, a lot of intrigue and people asking questions and wanting answers. But remember, this happened in March and it wasn't until uh, June of that same year, 97, that it started getting national press. The U USA Today had a front page story about the Phoenix right. Lights. And so it was in June when Symington held that press conference. Okay, okay, yeah, I remember. Um, hearing about the USA Today headline. And that's, again, like you said, that's when it went worldwide and everyone started talking about it. And then I think the pressure started coming on 
to kind of the people in Phoenix to explain this, for the military to explain this. Because, again, yeah. these things were seen over the major airports. They were seen over the city. Uh, this could be a potential threat. Uh, we have to keep that in mind, right? A lot of that credit, if not most of that credit, goes to Frances Barwood, who was a Phoenix City councilwoman at the time. And she's the one who, during a council meeting, suggested that they should look into this because a lot of constituents were calling in and saying, hey, we, what's going on here? Is there any answers to explain this? So she brought it up during a council meeting and she was met with ridicule and scorn. And she even says that a city manager came up to her after her and said, you shouldn't have said that. And you know, she took it seriously and she, she fielded phone calls from thousands of witnesses. You know, she took it very seriously and wanted to help people find answers. But her colleagues, uh, you know, and people from the, the governor's office, they kind of harassed her at work. You know, they would hang little goofy, funny alien jokes, you know, in her office and on her photo in the hall and, you know, uh, tell people that if they want to talk to her, they need to speak into the tinfoil and things like that. I mean, she was just just made fun of because she was looking into this matter seriously. And, you know, that around that time, too, was also Five Symington seemingly joking about it as well. So well, a lot of that ridicule played into, uh, you know, played as obstacles for anybody trying to get serious uh, investigation into this. Right, right. And, you know, serious is another way to look at it because a lot of the witnesses they didn't think it was funny that Fife Simonton did this joke press conference, which he called kind of a prank on on the media because the media was pushing for answers. So he gave them his answers and uh, the calls started flooding in to Francis Barwood again, kind of the unsung hero, I think, in the entire event that occurred and kind of the, um, you know, the hit she took. I actually have some archival footage from a news uh, segment that took place locally in Phoenix of um, Francis talking about getting these calls and how uh, she perceived what um, the governor had done at the time. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, bear with me, guys, here. Make sure I have the right one. Yeah, let's hear from Francis Barwood. Barwood uh, asked for a similar investigation not long ago. We have her on the telephone now. Ms. Barwood, what's your reaction at this point? Well, I've gotten many phone calls from people that are very upset that this is a joke, and I'm wondering, you know, now with the confusion, is he really going to do an investigation, or was the entire thing a joke? Well, we just heard from his chief of staff that the, that they have, um, in fact, asked for an investigation. We'll see if that turns out to be a joke as well. Uh, but the investigation you called for never uh, panned out. You got uh, roundly criticized for that as well. Right, and that was kind of surprising because, you know, all I did was ask for us to look into what so many people saw and to find out if, one, if it was military and shame on them for doing it, uh, two, if it was a hoax and how did they do it, and three, if it was something else, but at the very least look into it and see what it was. Do you at all feel like the governor and his office were making fun of you? Um, I would hope that, uh, you know, he hasn't gone to that level. <laughs> Um, I, I get an awful lot of that from the mayor himself, so I, I, I doubt that uh, that's his type of sense of humor. I'm hoping what he's done is uh, made, you know, his little joke for the summer and that he will do a serious investigation because to thousands of people, this is a very serious thing, and they're very, very concerned, you know, that nobody wants to even look into it. City Councilwoman Frances Barwood, what are callers telling you? Well, a lot of things. They said, you know, what's going on? He, he goes into the court and he comes out and he changes his mind and, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff. But everyone that's called me is very angry. Again, this local politics drama is what I live for, especially when it comes to a UFO event. So, yeah, well, man. You want a little more pissed. political drama with that. Uh, yeah. During, during that interview or <laughs> during the press conference, I think that was during the time when Symington was actually being uh, indicted for multiple counts of fraud. So Right. Yep. There's that, too. So, <laughs> didn't he? No, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't he save a president's life or something like that? He, he, That's how he, he got did. Pardoned. He he saved Bill Clinton's life, apparently. Uh, yeah. So so what happened was he was he was convicted of of uh, multiple counts of bank fraud or something. And that was eventually overturned. But before the feds could, 
you know, retry or bring the, bring the charges again, um, Bill Clinton pardoned him. And apparently when they were kids, Symington saved uh, Clinton from, from a riptide from drowning or something. Somewhere there on the There you East go, Coast. guys. Yeah. You never know when something will come back to either bite you in the ass or help you out. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind for future politics. But I, I do I think Symington gets a bad rap, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But, uh, you know, for people who just casually look into this case and they see that press conference, you know, all of a sudden Symington is is vilified and he, he's the bad guy in this whole thing when actually I think he comes out looking pretty good. Right. He does have a redemption story in all this. Um, well, let's hop into that. Uh, so, you know, Fife Simonton clearly didn't take this too seriously. Um, he did want to do this press conference to kind of calm people down and hopefully just put it to rest. Like it was clearly yeah. something prosaic. We might not know exactly what it is, but um, there is an explanation. We're fine moving on. Um, but the people of Phoenix were not ready to move on. They wanted answers because the, the, the thing with this is people had so many varying experiences with it. Some saw it really up close, some far away. Some said that like they had this instant amnesia when the event happened. Um, you know, I've explored cases of this as well, where people saw UFOs and immediately forgot about it. Like within seconds, almost like the men in black syndrome, um, or their emotions were manipulated or, or something like that occurred. And there are people, um, with the Phoenix lights who have said that that happened. So clearly that wasn't just a balloon or a flare that did that to them. Um, is it something within them, their physiology, their mental state during the event, adrenaline emotions? I don't know. But um, people were pissed about this press conference. Francis Barwood uh, eventually, I believe, was voted out um, because of the stigma behind her defending this thing and keeping it going. Um, and again, unsung hero of all this, but let's get to it. Fife well, Simonton, his redemption. And before that, if you for for anyone who wants to hear more from yeah, Francis please. Barwood, uh, we did have her as a guest at the International UFO Congress. I forget what right. year that was, but there is you know recording of her her uh, presentation from that event. So if you want to hear all about her story and everything she went through during that incident, um, you can find that that presentation from the International UFO Congress. Yeah, I believe it was 2013. Um, I was Sounds researching right. it last night. Um, Sounds right. And it's pretty emotional. Yeah, she goes through her whole journey with all of this. And again, like, kind of took the hits for, for everybody with it, un unfortunately. But okay, Fife Simonton. Simonton. Redemption story. Um, let's play um, this clip from John Hook, a local uh, news anchor, very famous in Phoenix. I had the pleasure of doing an interview with him and Jeremy Corbell, which people still bring up to this day. Um, I looked so young and, uh, and skinny hey, I'm so glad you were then. there to do that. <laughs> you you saved us all you by doing that interview. Guard. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was super fun. Um, but uh, yeah, so Fife Simonton did this really um, in-depth interview with John Hook. And I'm going to play a little bit of that now and get his redemption story. So he would eventually come forward and admit that he also was a witness to this. Check this out, guys. March 13th, 1997. This event called Lights Over Phoenix. What did you see? Well, I saw a, uh, a huge craft just kind of come right over Squaw Peak um, that was, you know, it was just breathtaking. And um, I'm not sure about the, the date. You've, you've got a better memory March for the 13th. dates than I do. Yeah. But there was no like the Clinton day, no? No. <laughs> no, I was on a strict diet. <laughs> no, I'm serious, I'm serious now. That, that it was a, it was a, unquestionably it was a UFO, which means unidentified flying object. Right. Doesn't nothing, mean we're being visited. Well, it's nothing like anything I've ever seen. And, and you're an Air Force guy. Yeah, yeah, and a pilot. Uh, got a lot of hours flying. So uh, it was pretty breathtaking. Did it frighten you? No, I, no I, I think I was kind of in awe, really, you know. How big? Bigger than anything I've ever seen in the sky. Like an aircraft carrier in the yeah, sky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that, yeah. And it, and it was hard to define because of the light in terms of the size, but it, but it was absolutely silent and had sort of eerie embedded lights. And, you know, so that's what I saw. And I wasn't expecting to see anything because I was looking out over at Luke uh, right. to the west. And... Uh, and then all of a sudden, these people in the park, uh, 
area on the just on the west side of 51. There were a bunch of people there. Everybody said, oh, look at that. And we turned around, and this thing was coming from the northwest, traveling to the southeast. There have been so many different sort of sightings and inexplicable phenomena that, you know, um, but, but the disparity um, in terms of technological progress would be so vast that we would be, I think, of sort of no consequence to whoever is visiting us because the technology to get here would be just beyond anything we could imagine. Did it hover? No, it was just going in a straight line. Slow pace. Yeah, slow pace, yeah. And then, you know, there were all Not the sightings. Flares. There were the sightings of the America West plane coming into Sky yeah. Harbor, said he could have landed on it. It was enormous. Yeah. Like an aircraft carrier in the sky, is that about as close yeah, I as think that's, I think that's a fair description, oh my yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. There we go. There's Mr. Fife Symington's redemption story. So what did you think, Jason, when you heard that, um, you know, after making fun of this and everything, he now admitted to being a part of it? But not only that, like believing this was not of earthly explanation in his opinion. Yeah. What do you make of all that? Yeah, that was amazing when he actually started talking about it and we learned the backstory and the things that were going on behind the scenes. You know, like I said, the knee-jerk reaction for UFO researchers, you know, seeing the press conference is thinking that uh, Symington was making a joke of it and he didn't take it seriously and all that. But in fact, we find, found out that he was actively trying to get answers. He was pressing the Air Force bases and he was getting stonewalled. They weren't giving him any answers and he was getting frustrated by that. Um, here he is, the governor of the state, unable to get answers from the military bases within the state. Um, it was very frustrating for him. And uh, yeah, as he said, he was a captain in the Air Force, a pilot. And he said that he'd never seen anything like that before. And he's also, in other views, said that he's convinced that what he saw was not from this world. Uh, you know, he's, James Fox has interviewed him on, in his documentaries um, in 2007. Symington moderated uh, the National Press Club event that uh, Leslie Kane and, and James Fox put together. So we spoke about it there, too. Um, Symington's testimony, you know, a, as a witness to the Phoenix Lights has been hugely powerful and just illustrates the problems of trying to get answers when it comes to UFOs and, and the difficulty getting government uh, bodies to talk to each other and share information. Right, exactly. And, you know, I know you've written about the Phoenix Lights a lot back in the day when you were working with Open Minds. And, um, yeah, you've done a lot of great work on this case overall. And when it comes to covering this case as a journalist, you also have to cover the skeptical side of all this, the theories, the explanations of what the Phoenix Lights could have been. Um, so I guess... Let's kind of fast forward a little bit to what some of those theories that have been posed, Jason, about what the Phoenix Lights were, what the military came forward and said was going on. Um, yeah, could you maybe run us through some of those theories on, on exactly what this event could have been, these videos that were caught later in the night, I believe, around like 10-ish, mm -hmm. 1030, even though people started reporting these V-shaped craft around 8 o'clock, 830. Yeah, yeah. What were some of those theories posed on what the Phoenix Lights were? Well, certainly we have, you know, just regular planes flying in formation. Being a night sky, it's hard to tell when things are separate individual sources of light or if they're connected to one larger craft. And even the, the accounts, many of the accounts that talk about a singular large craft, uh, you know, there's not a, a, a lot of ability to determine detail other than saying, well, it kind of blocked out the stars or whatever. Um, and many of them even talk about the lights changing position you know, or the triangle shape with a light in front of it and a light trailing it. A um, lot of different different stories there that, you know, maybe could be explained by by separate craft. I, I don't know. But uh, flares, obviously, is, is the one that comes to mind the most because the appearance is very close to flares. And it does seem from some of the videos that are, have been popularized that there were flares being dropped. And that's what the military says. There were, were exercises taking place that night. And I certainly don't discount that. I think certainly that could, that could be the case. And I know uh, Dr. Len Kitai, one of the leading, probably the leading uh, experts on the Phoenix Lights, she's mm -hmm. devoted a lot of her life to, to being the go-to person for that. Um, love, love Len and she does a great job. But something that she says, is, and a lot of people repeat, is that, as I mentioned with my personal sighting, it's not uncommon to see flare drops in this area. And Dr. Kita uses that as a basis to say, 
Obviously, people in Phoenix have seen this before. They would know what flares look like. And that's a big jump because most people haven't seen military flares drop. Even in Phoenix, where you can see it quite frequently, it, the fifth largest city in the country, four and a half million people or something, still not everybody's going to be looking in the same spot in the sky at the same time. Not everybody's gonna have the same vantage points. So it's not something that people immediately identify. So it's always possible that many people saw flares and for the first time, as we just saw in San Diego, right? There was a big, big <laughs> hullabaloo in, in San Diego this year right. with clear military, military flares dropped over a military t testing range, um, you know, pretty, pretty clear cut. But with the Phoenix Lights, the flare theory, uh, you know, was heavily investigated. And again, with the military not offering ex explanation, um, you know, until half a year later, what they eventually settled on for their explanation was that the flare, these, these were military flares and they were dropped by a group that, uh, a squadron that flew out of Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, which is two hours south of Phoenix. And they were a part of what they call uh, Project Snowbird, which is an arrangement they work out with, with uh, squadrons from other states where, you know, in March, they're usually dealing with snow and, and bad weather. They come to Arizona for their training because we don't have those issues. We just have beautiful weather all the time. So that's what they identified. They identified a squadron from the, the Maryland Air National Guard that was in Davis Mothman Air Force Base doing their training at uh, the Barry Goldwater test range. And I believe it was, they claimed it was their last day of doing the exercises. And before they returned to base, they jettisoned all their remaining flares and went back to Tucson. There are a lot of problems with that. Number one being the, the, the time that they proposed this happens. It doesn't line up with witness accounts. Number two, what I already mentioned about the flares and you know their five minute burn times, um, that clearly wasn't, wasn't seen in, in many of the sightings. Um, you also have the fact that, I mean, from what I understand, and again, I'm not in the military, I'm not a pilot who does this type of stuff, but from what I understand, it's not uncommon to jettison the remaining flares before returning to base. I think that's ridiculous because these flares are actually thousands of dollars <laughs> with military spending, you know, and government spending that apparently is not an issue, but I would think they would want to keep those unless they can't be reused once they're loaded for some reason. But also where these things were seen over a metropolitan area, major metropolitan area and Phoenix, Arizona, March, hate to tell you, but we've always been in a ginormous drought. Everything is dry and the state would catch on fire if you're just dropping these flares, you know, ah, randomly over wherever you want, because I'm dumping and going back to base. It, it's horribly irresponsible, and Francis Barwood even touched on that. It's it's sloppy, it's dangerous, and somebody should be held accountable for that. But even the the pilots who participated um, in that 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 training, that testing from the Mar Maryland Air National Guard, um, didn't come forward for a long time, and people saw that as a red flag. However, as I pointed out this really wasn't a national story. Um, it gained some momentum um, in June, and that's when you know some calls were made, that's when people started hearing about it. But you know, with all of the hype that was generated, they certainly didn't think, oh, that could have been us. You know, it wasn't something they really talked about or, or considered thinking maybe we should come forward and admit this. So you know, there are lots of excuses, lots of long drawn out stories. But ultimately, the biggest, you know, being Symington getting stonewalled, not being able to find answers, Francis Barwood not being able to get answers, and the general public being ultimately delivered an answer that doesn't line up with the facts. Welcome to Ufology 101. Oh, yeah. Never seems to line up. Well, um, the, one of the points you bring up, Jason, is very important, and that's timing. Now, again, the flares wouldn't last that long. They would burn if they hit the ground, very irresponsible. Uh, there's so many factors that just don't line up with that, with that uh, explanation. And also the fact that people were seeing a solid craft, as they say, uh, sure. around 8.30. Now, again, that's you know open for speculation as well. Was it one solid craft? Was it five airplanes in a V formation? We don't know. Uh, but 
we were able uh, through, you know, rigorous investigation by a lot of ufologists and people uh, find what is allegedly, and I do use that word very, um, very responsibly here, allegedly the V-shaped craft that was seen that night. There is a video. So I do want to show that right now. Uh, the original videographer did want to remain anonymous, but I was able to obtain this through uh, Tom King who did that other video as well. Um, and this is in the public forum. I can't pretend that I'm the first to show this or anything, but it is quite fascinating. I'd love to get your thoughts, Jason, on what this might be. Let's look at the V-shaped craft um, that supposedly was over Phoenix back in 97. Initial thoughts, Jason? What do you think? I'm going to have a seizure. <laughs> yeah, it's a little disorienting. I'm I glad know. I wasn't I watching know. that on full screen. Wow. <laughs> you know, um, that, what do you that, make that, of it? I don't know. Well, welcome to UFO videos, right? And especially night videos. It's, it's really hard to get any detail or, or any points of reference or anything. So it does look like points of light. But other than that, you know, there's nothing really we can determine from that. But it does look like, you know, something's there. There are, are distinct points of light. But... Yeah, that's it. I, I find it interesting. There was no sound. But again, that could be just they turned the sound off on the video. Um, you know, the lights didn't seem to be blinking. But again, we don't have any idea the distance. We don't know the time, the date, nothing yeah. like that, which makes this so horribly frustrating. What if this and, was know, an actual V-shaped craft from the event? And the same same thing with, with the Phoenix lights, right? I mean, with all the videos we have, it's still points of light in a nighttime sky it's almost impossible to get any sort of detail, you know, to be able to determine shape of craft or if it was a solid craft or what the actual, you know, appearance might be. Um, you know, already, even, even with those old cameras, you're, you're getting a lot of noise introduced there, a lot of artifacts going on as the, the camera's trying to, to piece together what it's seeing in the, in the night sky. Um, that's, that's the frustrating reality of, of dealing with UFO photos and videos. It is. It always is. Um, well, let's, uh, I guess, backtrack just a bit. Now, a few years ago, and a lot of people put this in the chat already, um, talk about Kurt Russell, talk about Kurt Russell. <laughs> um, he does have a connection to the Phoenix Lights. Um, let, let's go ahead and play the video. This came from cool. um, a press junket he was doing with Chris Pratt for, I believe it was Guardians of the Galaxy 2, I think, that Kurt Russell was in. Um, and the topic of the Phoenix Lights came up by the host, and, um, and then Kurt Russell just let it rip. So let's go ahead and play that for the audience right now. ...place in Arizona. An unidentified pilot, according to the press cuttings, flying near an airport in Arizona with his son when he spotted six lights in the night sky. Mm -hmm. So he called from the aeroplane to air traffic control to say, I'm seeing these lights <coughs> here. I wasn't expecting any other planes. They're none supposed to be on my landing path. Can you tell me what's going on? They said there are no other planes. He said, I'm seeing six bright lights coming towards me. Mystery unresolved. Except, oh. tail number for that plane was Bonanza 2 Tango Sierra, and I was the pilot. No, no. way. Oliver and I. Take us back. He doesn't say that in the yeah. briefing. Take Oliver and I. Or I should have yeah. read to the end. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver and I were, were flying in. I was flying him to go see his girlfriend. And uh, we were on approach. And uh, I saw six lights over the airport and absolute uniform in a V shape. And I, and Oliver said to me, I, I was just looking at him and I was coming in, we're maybe a half a mile out and Oliver said, Pa, do you, what, is, what are those lights? And I, and I, then it kind of like came out of my <clears throat> reverie and, and I said, I don't know what they are. I said, uh, he said, are we okay here? And I said, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to call him. And I reported it. And they said, we're not painting anything. We don't show anything. I said, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to declare 
It's unidentified, it's flying, and it's six objects. Mm -hmm. We landed. I taxied, dropped him off, took off, went back to L.A. Never said a word. He never said a word. I never thought of it. Two years later, Goldie is watching a television show when I came home. Yeah. And the show is on UFOs. But as I'm, I, I came home, hey, honey, how's it going? Boom. And I'm kind of hearing this t the TV going, and I stopped, and I started watching, and it was on that event. Now, that was the most, um, that was the most viewed mm -hmm. UFO event. Over 20,000 people uh -huh. saw that. Uh -huh. And I'm watching this, and I f I'm feeling like uh, Richard Dreyfuss mm -hmm. in, in uh, <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Count. It's like, why, why do I know this, you know? What? And it's not clear to me. And finally I said, then they said the pilot reported it, a general aviation pilot reported it on landing. I had never thought of it since then, and I said, I, that was me. I, that was me. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I'll go to my logbooks. So I went to my logbooks, and there was the flight at that time, and I didn't mention anything about the UFO. The fascinating part of that to me Whoa. is that it yeah. would just went literally out of my head. Mm. Yeah. And I, Oliver never mentioned it. And had I not seen that show, I'd have never thought of it again. Amazing. Now, that, to me, was the weird part. There we go. Kurt Russell possibly was the first, you know, civilian pilot to report this thing. What did you think when you first heard about this, man? Oh, it's pretty cool. And I, I love the response, too, because that's kind of the response that a lot of people have with UFO sightings. You know, you see something like like I did. You see something, you kind of scratch your head, you're, you're confounded by it. But uh, later, when you hear about it, you're all, oh, yeah, I did. I did uh, see that. Hmm. Other people saw it, too. Interesting. And I love how Goldie Hawn was just watching TV, watching a UFO show. And he's all, wait a second. Randomly. I, I'm guessing it was probably like one of James Fox's uh, documentaries or something, possibly. But yeah. And then the other weird thing he says at the end is that he didn't log the UFO when he put it in his journal there. Um, and that he doesn't know why he didn't. That, again, that kind of harkens back to this idea of whatever these things were. It made people almost forget it immediately. Now, again, we're not here to discuss the woo factor of all this. But it does have to uh, be posed a theory that whatever these things were in Phoenix uh, was able to mess with people. Or, again, like you always say, memory is faulty. We can't trust it when it comes to these things. And... Um, and we truly don't know what, what's going on. So I thought that was a cool little tidbit to add in there that Kurt Russell was a part of the Phoenix Lights incident, uh, especially was. in a press you know, jacket that's, for that's that movie. That's the fun <laughs> thing about historical cases. You know, over the years, we always get these little nuggets that add something new to it and keeps it alive and keeps uh, introduces it to new people and helps new people get involved in the investigation process. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and um, we've had a, a lot of celebrities come forward. Russell Crowe saw a UFO. Um, what's that dude? Machine Gun Kelly. Uh, the list goes on oh, yeah. and on. Um, what's uh, the guy who went out to Skinwalker Ranch as well? The rapper there. Um, ah, gosh, oh, yeah. Post Malone. Post Malone. Post Malone. There, there we go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. Crazy, crazy. The, uh, the way this topic has exploded into the mainstream like never before. Um, well, all right, so we kind of run through the theories of what the Phoenix Lights were and um, weren't and in the timeline of events. So how does, in your opinion, Jason, uh, living in Phoenix, how does the city embrace this event? You know, in Roswell, they have a festival every year. Um, same with a lot of other small towns that have had famous UFO sightings. Um, what is kind of the, the overall consensus in Phoenix of this event? Has it hurt the town? Has it helped? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that as a resident? There's not a whole lot here about the Phoenix Lights. You know, it's a lot of people, again, fifth largest city in the country. So we've got millions of people kind of doing their own thing. Um, there is a electronic music festival, I think, called the Phoenix Lights Festival or something like that. Um, but I don't think it's at all related. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's not any fe annual festival or anything official that happens here to celebrate it or anything like that. But when you talk to people here, um, good chance that uh, the person you're talking to either saw the Phoenix Lights or knows somebody who did. Um, certainly with, with this topic opening up as a, an acceptable conversation to have with people, an acceptable topic to talk about, people are more and more willing to, to you know, stand up and say, yeah, I saw that too. 
pretty cool. But it, it's just kind of accepted here that it happened. It was cool. But we don't we don't brag about it like like Roswell does. I feel like that should be fixed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys are a bit more reserved. Well, there we should mention, I believe it's the Heritage Center in Phoenix does have like a small exhibit um, that yep. you can walk through and see the timeline of the events, the photos yeah. taken, the videos, uh, which is really cool. I had the the opportunity to walk through that with uh, Dr. Lynn Katai, one of the original videographers of the Phoenix Lights. And um, I will she's say just one of a the wealth of information. Yeah. One of the coolest things that, you know, related to the Phoenix Lights here is, you know, credit to Lynn Kitai because she does every year host a screening of her documentary about the Phoenix Lights and always has special guests come and, you know, speak before or after the showing. Um, it's a, a pretty cool event and she she keeps that going and new witnesses come forward, new information comes out and she she updates the film, she updates her website. So that's always interesting. And, you know, Fife Symington, I think, has been there, but he certainly was uh, was a guest at the International UFO Congress. Um, last year or the year before, I believe. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, she, she keeps it alive, keeps it going. And, and you know, I think we'll do more to, uh, you know, have more of a, a presence here in Phoenix, not on the scale of a, a Roswell UFO festival, but, you know, little things like that with exhibits and things like that to help people understand the, the details of the case. Because as with most UFO cases, even monsters like Roswell, most people in the general public and even within the UFO community only know a little bit of the, uh, the the information, just few bits and pieces here and there. Because this is you and I like to always say, Ryan, it's fascinating when we speak at conferences and Comic Cons and things like that, how common it is for people to come up and, and talk about things like Roswell, but not even know where Roswell is. Or <laughs> they think Roswell is the same thing as Area 51, you know, things like that. So a lot of the a lot of the details you know are lost on people, and that's understandable because people aren't diving in and researching UFOs. They're just casually interested in something strange that happened. Absolutely, and I think one of the things that you and I are a huge advocate of is uh, getting the younger public interested in this topic, in the, the case history. You know, so many people, probably in the chat here as well, uh, have you know admittedly said. I just got into UFOs back when the New York Times article came out and the Navy videos came out. Like, I know I have a lot of catching up to do. Uh, and that's cool. Same with uh, Luis Elizondo, the former head of the Pentagon UFO program. He admits that, like, yeah, I didn't I know the history of a lot of this stuff. I was tasked at looking at cases happening when I was working there. Um, but I think, again, it's important to get the younger people uh, involved in, and interested and know what has come before these Navy UFO videos. And, and the Phoenix Lights is one of those. And what we do over at Mysteries Decoded, the television show on the CW, is introduce these cases to a younger generation that's never heard of Brazil, never heard of the Phoenix Lights. And uh, you actually are going to be making an appearance on an upcoming episode of Mysteries Decoded. It's going to air, guys, August 24th. Uh, on the CW, and we've got a little bit of a, I guess, back, backstage uh, look <laughs> at some of the stuff that's going to be going on. There's me with Link Katai. Um, there's Jason, me, and Jennifer Marshall, my investigative partner at Mysteries Decoded. Uh, Tom King down there in the bottom, looking at his amazing cameras he has set up, trained on the skies of Phoenix constantly. Dude's got like a whole HQ there. We got to go visit him at his house. He also has a life-sized um, not R2-D2, but one of the droids from Star Wars that he built from scratch, which That's was awesome. the coolest thing ever. Oh, my God. Um, we got some of Linkatai's photos there of the Phoenix Lights. And um, two gentlemen I just want to touch on here as well are at the bottom there, Clifford Mahoney, a Zuni tribe elder in Phoenix, who actually I got the immense pleasure of hiking up in the mountains in Phoenix to look at some petroglyphs of what uh, is claimed to be the star people and um, their possible connection to the Phoenix Lights incident as well. We did lose Clifford uh, not too long ago, unfortunately. Um, so again, it was such an honor to get to finally meet him and, and hike the mountains. And dude, this guy had like a, a kidney transplant, I think maybe six months before I hiked this mountain with him. And he beat me up there. So that tells you a lot right there. Cliff was a badass. He really was. He really was. And, and again, a sweetheart and a sweetheart. Uh, so is, is he going to be in the episode? Do you know for sure? Yes. Um, I have seen oh, a rough kind of the be episode. So amazing. 
Yeah. He made it in there. Um, we do dive deep into the Native American aspect to the UFO phenomenon and its possible connection to the Phoenix Lights. Um, I won't give away too much on that that side of it, but I do think there might be something to be said about it. Um, and then the last image I want to touch on in this upcoming episode of Mysteries Decoded is you only see the back of him, but up there we have um, a pilot who Jennifer and I had the pleasure of interviewing um he i don't know they might show his face they might not he did want to remain anonymous when we interviewed him that might have changed once the episode airs so you guys will have to check that out but he was a pilot and did witness the phoenix lights that night um so we're going to get his side of the event what he thinks it could have been could have not been and everything in between so um wanted to show that little image of him there to tease you guys but yeah the episode is going to premiere august 24th on the cw guys check your local listings for that um we are going to revisit the phoenix lights like never before and jason will be featured in that episode as well it was such a pleasure buddy meeting you up there um which mountain was that that we were on it was south mountain the... okay. south mountain yeah yep, it was fun yep. being up there you get a bird's eye view of the city it was awesome Ah, so beautiful. And and the reason that Jennifer Jennifer and I were reinvestigating, I guess, the Phoenix Lights is because there were recent sightings of the same sort of phenomena happening in the area. I believe it was, you know, just a couple years ago. Um, but again, it could have been anything, but we thought it was worth reopening the investigation and connecting it to what these lights could have been recently in Phoenix. So yeah, yeah. Definitely check that out, guys, if you can. Um that's kind of it, my man, in terms of the Phoenix Lights. But we do have some listener questions here, if you're willing to stick around for just a little bit um, for some of these. What do you think? What do you say? You cool. bet. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is an interesting one. Austin asks, Jason, have you since encountered any story of evidence that beat your own experience? Um, yeah, what, I guess, any cases that really stick out to you that you've personally looked into that uh, really stand the test of time? Hmm. Well, like I said, I mean, for, for me with, with, in terms of the Phoenix lights, um, uh, it didn't really impact me that much at the time. Um, you know, aside from lights in the sky that shouldn't really be there and, you know, kind of confused me. Um, I think many other witnesses to the Phoenix lights have far more exciting stories than I do. <laughs> but, uh, in terms of other, other sightings I've had personally, I mean, I, I think, Many of the the craft or objects I've I've seen, you know, and I, I told you this on the show before, Ryan, but I, I've lost count of the UFOs I've seen. And when I say UFO, meaning things in the sky that I haven't ever been able to to come up with a satisfactory uh, explanation for. Um, I, I say about a dozen dozen UFOs, and several of those have been you know strange strange shapes, low hanging in the sky from rectangles to even like a hexagon, just some some weird weird things that again you know don't make sense in my mind. They don't belong where I saw them. Um, so personal experience, and this is something you cover extensively, Ryan. Personal experience, there's no substitute for when it comes to UFOs. Like your own experience, really is the best evidence that you can have because you can see all the photos and all the videos and hear all the incredible stories, but you weren't there. You don't know what this person saw and you didn't experience what they experienced. I can look at a photo and say, yeah, that looks like this. That's most likely what it was, but I wasn't there. I didn't see it. They were, they had their own experiences. So to equate, uh, you know, levels of, of, you know, evidentiary value or, or credibility or, or something that's more wow factor. Um, man, being in UFO so long, I, I've seen so many more things that are far surpass anything that I've experienced personally. That's fair, man. Yep. Yep. And like you said, we weren't there when it happened. So we can't really have a final determination of what the Phoenix lights were, what these things you were saw in what thousands of people all over the world are seeing on a daily basis. Um, and other people have video of the Phoenix lights. Where's my video footage? Got <sighs> Is of you playing baseball or something probably, right? <laughs> it's probably my, my, my little, my brothers were, were, were little and, and very much involved in sports all the time, soccer and baseball. So it's probably one of their games that recorded over it. Ah, damn. But as damn I said, it. I mean, that, that's why I scan that footage, hoping for like a cut, you know, between stop and record where I could have a flash of the Phoenix lights that I could get a, a still from. But that's lost forever, man. It's lost. Alas. I just got to let it go. 
just let it go. Crash Bob Squarepants. Some people said they received a message. This is only a demonstration. Uh, did you get anything similar, Jason? Hmm. Um, now, this is another theory we didn't touch on with Phoenix Lights. Is this idea that maybe this was some sort of uh, stealth craft or, or balloon low altitude thing that they were testing? And they wanted to see how many people would report this thing um, right. and test it out. And, you know, once it got on the news and everything... Everyone was saying they saw it. Um, do you think this could have been some sort of test that they were trying to see how the public would react to it or how many people would actually see this stealth craft? Again, we're talking mid-90s. This was the height of you know the bombers and the stealth technology really coming to light for the public, at least. It was probably being tested much earlier than that, as we always hear that thing. Um, what do you think about this all being some sort of test on the public? You know... In this field, you learn to consider all possibilities, and that's certainly one of them. Um, you know, I can't rule that out. Um, it might seem far-fetched, but you know, the government and the military has conducted testing on the, on the public before, and you know, we could posit that same same possibility with like the Tic Tac video and all that stuff. You know, where where they actually testing their own soldier, the, the, their own pilots to see if they would release this information, you know, how well they would follow protocol, uh, you know, what information would get leaked. Uh, you know, we can speculate all day, but, uh, you know, with the Phoenix Lights, yeah, I mean, I, I heard that a lot from a lot of people who have talked about this. And I could even convince myself that, you know, something was forcing me to go out and observe this thing because I, I did have this impulse to continually, continuously look at it and, and go out and, uh, and check on it. So I don't think that's likely <laughs> just because, you know, that, that, that is a stretch. I think many, 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 many other things are, are more likely a uh, possibility than that, but I certainly entertain it. That's fair, my man. Um, well, let's move on to our final listener questions here with more current things going on in the UFO world. It's been a, a while since you and I have caught up. Um, let's start with Lou over at UCR. He asks, can't wait to hear Jason's thoughts on the Calvine photo. Now, this is a case out of Scotland, uh, my new homeland very, very soon, um, of an event that happened that was supposedly investigated, at least the photos were, by the ministry of defense they were uh you know held lock and key for almost 32 years they were supposed to be classified for another i don't know 40 50 years something like that but apparently they finally were released to the public our friends over at the uh at uap media uk uh were able to obtain some of the original photos from the calvine event so jason what are your thoughts on the whole calvine ufo incident and this recent photo that finally came forward to i don't know demystify or i guess even mm. mystify more this event <laughs> what are your thoughts on the whole calvine ufo incident making the rounds right now yeah sure so i mean it's cool we finally see this and you know despite all, all of the hype we have to remember that, you know, it, this is still just a, a photo with sort of a dubious background and uh, questionable witnesses. But the biggest thing that makes this exciting is because we do have some MOD involvement. We do have some a, a alleged photo analysis that was done on this by officials. And we have the mystery of them withholding the release of the originals for many, many years to come. Um, it certainly wasn't classified and, you know, the information that it, the photos didn't belong to the government. They were belonged to the photographers who tried to sell them to a newspaper. And when that didn't happen, they kind of went dark, but, and they were also poachers. So, I mean, we have a lot of red flags with the witnesses and the fact that they can't be tracked down. We can't ask any more questions. We can't definitively know where the photos were taken because the camera they use, you know, we don't have access to that. Uh, we don't have geolocation uh, tagged to that because it was a film, film camera. Um, lots of interesting things about this. So as I pointed out, the UFO world is filled with 
infinite numbers of UFO photos and videos that are worlds better than this in terms of quality and detail and things like that. So calling it the, the world's best UFO photo ever is, is uh, subjective and a stretch in my mind, but it is cool. And we've got a backstory to it. We've got some details from some investigation that was done years ago. Uh, we can't validate any of that. We can't talk anymore to the witnesses to really know for certain where this photo was taken, what the conditions were. Um, it's hard to tell. And again, you'll, you'll experience this soon, Ryan, but nine o'clock at night is, is still, still pretty bright in Scotland <laughs> in, in August. It can be. Um, but you know, there's also all sorts of things that happen there weather wise, like cloud inversions. And I know that sounds like swamp gas, but these are real things that we have to deal with in the UFO world when we're looking at photos and videos. Um, Plenty of, of theories posited here with reflections and things like that. People point out, oh, there's no water there. But again, we're relying on old testimony from people that we can't track down. Um, we don't know 100% for sure where this photo was taken. So there are nearby locks. Um, there are bodies of water. There are bodies of water in that area that, that uh, do change. They, they are man-made reservoirs, basically, that, that raise and lower depending on the time of the year. So just a lot of unanswered things with this photo. I love all the sleuthing that's happening, all of the, the different different uh, hypotheses being being brought forward and just, just rigorous testing. But I will point out, I, I do love the kind of silliness of, of the UFO world when looking at this because I don't know about you, but when you went to the story where these guys broke the, and provided this, this photo to us, the image clearly said, not for, for, for any other use. Don't repurpose this. Don't uh, you know, modify it. Don't use it without getting permission first. First thing everybody did was you know, do their artificial intelligence uh, you know, zooming and cropping and, and trying to get a better look at this thing while you know, thinking that that uh, told us anything about this blurry photo. It's just enhanced the artifacts and stuff that are already there and the AI models uh, you know, just compound the, the problems there. Um, I, I, I'm watching this like everybody else. I mean, all, all I can do and all anybody else can do is offer our personal opinions. And, you know, based on my experience and what I've seen in other photos, you know, we're not going to be able to determine anything from this photo, really. You can spin it, uh, you know, to fit any sort of narrative you want. Um, you can turn it upside down. You can highlight this and highlight that. And, you know, until we know exactly where this was shot, um, we don't really have much more to go on. Um, that plane looks so weird to me, by the way. <laughs> how the, the wings, uh, you know, so I, I just don't understand how that would even fly. But I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's very confusing to me. Um, certainly not something I would call the best UFO photo ever. <laughs> but uh, good old Nick Pope uh, helped type that up. But uh, yeah, it is an interesting <laughs> one. It's interesting to see just how it's blown up. And I, I don't know. I mean, my personal opinion is it kind of makes the UFO research community look bad in a way, because again, there, it's not really that spectacular of a photo. It's very grainy. We don't have the details. We don't have first generation copies. Um, we don't even have the witnesses uh, and the photographer to talk to. So it, it is just yet another photo on the pile of billions of, of photos we already have. And as Alejandro Rojas and I have been talking about our days back at Open Minds, you know, we had uh, Wendell Stevens' entire photo archive and we would go through and, and you know, just look at hundreds of photos that were, were worlds better than that. I mean, a lot of them looked like hoax photos. Others were very mysterious, um, had a lot of detail with them about the investigation that was conducted. Uh, certainly ones that I would put up as best UFO photo ever, or certainly a good UFO photo over this photo any day. But yeah. again, it is nice that, and again, that's the power of the UFO research community and social media is just that crowdsourcing of trying to track things down, trying to get more answers. Because at this point, we don't have very much information to work on or work with. And that is the case with most things in UFOs. Absolutely, man. Yep. Couldn't put it better myself. The case remains open as it does with the Phoenix Lights as well. Um, bringing us up to really current, our last kind of start question here, Jason. Uh, I know it's not the lights, but did you hear about the spheres that are going to be featured on Sunday on ABC News? I didn't, I didn't know about this either. I know there's going to be a new special documentary coming out over in Australia, Seven News Now and Ross Coulthard 
are going to be looking into UFOs again. But yeah, are you familiar right. with this, this ABC News broadcast that's going to be going on or what's going no, on? No, I don't this? think so. I, I saw not. something recently about Spears, but I, I, I think that was probably tied to the, the Ross bit. But yeah. Okay. okay. Not that I've yeah. seen not i'm not aware either interesting well if something drops this week just more to talk about and more to Absolutely. catch up on <laughs> yeah that'll be cool um well hey my man thank you so much for you know sharing your personal sighting with us of the phoenix lights um i think it's so cool to meet someone that was actually there when this famous event happened and you have your own side to it your own thoughts your own theories so do hundreds of other witnesses who saw that and um i i think it's cool that we got kind of the um I guess the insider's view of it, if you will. Um, but yeah, what else is going on in your world of UFOs? Are you working on anything over at Rogue Planet? Um, I should stress that I am wearing the unknown t-shirt for your UFO podcast that I have the pleasure of um, being on every now and again with you guys over there. That's awesome. But yeah, yeah. What's what's going on in your world of UFOs? What can we expect? Yeah, so, so once you get settled in your new home uh, across the pond... We're, we're going to be uh, plotting and scheming. So I've got a, got a project that uh, we're working on right now for Rogue Planet that's going to be a, an animated project. So um, no promises, no, no timeline there, but it's, it's something that's in the works that is going to be UFO related for sure. Um, still working on my, my next book, um, life gets in the way and it's been slow going, but, uh, I'm probably about halfway through <laughs> with my next book. I know so that feeling. Working, working on that. But, uh, yeah, a, a, with Rogue Planet, we're going to, uh, be looking at getting back to doing regular UFO happy hour episodes where we can discuss, you know, current topics, um, just kind of in an informal setting and, and, uh, you know, riff and, and get each other's thoughts and opinions on, on current stories that are happening. Um, and some other shows we're going to try to try to bring out as well, including the the Rogue Planet podcast, bringing that back. So a couple things in the works, no promises, but uh, you know it's always a, a fun fun juggling act trying to fit the UFO world and the world of all things strange into into real life when it's no longer my full time career. So I know that feeling, man. Um, I you know even doing this today, I'm like ah ah, I'm, I'm like my 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 studio here is slowly getting taken down and i'm packing and like you said real life does get in the way but this is a topic that does bring a lot of people together you and i included we probably never would have met had it not been for this maybe we would have maybe we would have met at a blink 182 concert or less than jake concert i don't know it's possible probably it's would possible. have run into you at uh you know at the bar in a, in a theater at new york or something that like too. that yeah but yeah I, I tend to forget yeah. that aspect of my life <laughs> yeah yeah right so we probably would have run into each other but no ufo has brought us together brother it always does as it does everyone in the chat as well so guys i want to thank everyone who tuned in today to listen to jason and i talk all about the phoenix lights i hope you enjoyed this kind of overview of the event it was super fun again going through the history of it and um and yeah jason where can we find everything you're up to my man before we get going here Twitter's the best place. I post everything there. So at Acentric, right under my face there. And uh, yeah, that's how you can find everything I do. Awesome, brother. I'm going to do just a small recap with the audience here before um, I let them go. So um, stick around backstage. I'll chat with you in just a sec. And you thank it. you so much again for joining me on Somewhere in the Thank Scouts. you, Ryan. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks, buddy. Talk soon. Guys, again, one of my favorite human beings, Jason McClellan, joining us to talk all about the Phoenix Lights. I really hope you did enjoy this episode. It was super fun to put together. And I just want to tease, guys, what's going to be coming up next week on Somewhere in the Skies. We're actually going to have the former NASA deputy administrator on the show, and that is Lori Garver. She's going to be talking about her new book, Escaping Gravity. Uh, sh this woman has single-handedly, well, I shouldn't say single-handedly, with the work of a lot of other people at NASA, have completely changed the game when it comes to space exploration and integrating private space into NASA. You know, she basically says it could take 10 years and billions of dollars to do what other private companies could do in half that time and half the money. Um, so she has really shaken things up over there at NASA and has really uh, catapulted us into a new 
uh, a new world of space exploration. And we have her to thank for that. So she's going to be on the show to talk all about how that happened, when it happened, and what we can expect in the future of space exploration and from NASA as their amazing missions continue. So with all that being said, guys, I want to thank those for the super chat, super stickers for you guys sticking around here. Stay tuned for a lot more to come with somewhere in the skies in the future. I will be in another country once you hear the other episodes. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. So I will leave you with our motto as always, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. Have a wonderful day, morning, night, whatever it is, guys. And we'll talk soon. Keep looking up. Hey guys, Ryan here. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is a labor of love every week. And with that comes many different costs to keep the show running. That's where our Patreon campaign comes in. You give what you think the show is worth. There's different rewards available all the time, including shoutouts on the show, early editions of main episodes, bonus episodes and content, and very soon, monthly patron hangouts, where we sit back and chat all things UFOs. So I hope you'll consider becoming a Patreon subscriber today. To learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support and keep looking up.